Hello everybody, my name is Jimmy Smith and welcome to the Wine with Jimmy channel. Uh, this is a YouTube channel which has plenty of wonderful free content to help you with your wine studies. Um, this session is the first of six videos focusing on the wonderful world of sparkling wines. So the first four videos will be available for everybody to view free on YouTube and the last two sessions five and six will be available only on my e-learning portal and that is my portal for wine uh, knowledge and learning on the winewithjimmy.com website so you can go along there and sign up and subscribe if you wish to have access to a greater wealth of information and helpful things to help you really gain confidence to get you ready for your examinations. Um, so there'll be lots of multiple choice questions there and written questions, flashcards, revision sessions, plus much more greater video content. Really useful to give you the confidence to get you ready for your examinations. Um, so this one is going to be looking at the first section of sparkling wines and really looking at an introductory sense of sparkling wines, um, kind of key styles and labels, and then finally sweetness levels. Um, so this will set the scene for us so we can go through the rest of the sparkling wine videos so you can get a good uh, feel for the information that's needed on this section. Um, please be very, very aware as a student preparing for your level three examination, you will have a written question on sparkling and fortified wines. They are considered a unit and combined, they will be a 25 mark question. So really important for you to absolutely feel comfortable and confident in sparkling and fortified wines. So we're just focusing on sparkling wines in this section. So this is definitely one way you need to get your notebook out and you need to be making loads and loads of notes to really understand this, to be able to write um, answers to quite in-depth questions about this topic. Okay, um, if you have any comments or questions, please do pop them uh, in the comments section below this video on YouTube. Um, alternatively, there's social media at the bottom of every slide, which is my uh, handle on the bottom left, but then also my wine schools and my wine bar as well worth coming to see us at the wine school for further wine education or coming for a nice wonderful bottle of wine at Streatham Winehouse. Okay, so let's begin with vineyard classifications, uh, considerations rather, and then winery considerations. So what we really need to think about in terms of the natural factors and human factors when uh, crafting sparkling wines. So first of all here, we have vineyard considerations and we're talking about the grapes. Um, so this is sort of an introductory way of thinking what kind of state the grapes will need to be like in order to come into the winery to craft a high quality and premium sparkling wine. So here we go, they should be lower in sugar than normal light wines. Um, so they often will be found in cooler climates, so this is normally naturally achieved. So lower sugar to make a base wine of around 10 to 11% alcohol by volume. One of the major reasons for this is that wines, these wines will go through secondary fermentations, which will add um, often around one to 1 1.5% more alcohol by volume. Uh, so therefore that actually increases that alcohol overall. Uh, if you started with quite high sugar grapes, then of course you will have an issue with having far too much higher alcohol, and that may cause problems for balance in the wine later on down the line. So that is um, very important, lower sugar. The next thing is the acidity should be very high across the board. So this is generally quoted in your textbook for freshness. So this is to really give a, a lift and an, a kind of a fresh character to the sparkling wine. However, it is also really to withstand the aging processes that potentially that wine will go through. And that is what we call autolytic. So this of course is lees aging. So spending time on the dead yeast cells. Now, not all sparkling wines will go through this, but most of the premium ones certainly will. And you need that counterpoint 
of acidity to balance out the texture and the roundness and the richness that you'll get from the autolytic process. That is the reaction with the dead yeast cells to give it more creamy, biscuity, bready notes. If you lacked in acidity, the wine will actually seem quite rich and fat and flabby, meaning not so balanced. Um, so the acidity is very important to really keep freshness um, driving through fresh fruit character, but then counterpointing, balancing the autolytic characters that will come future and later down the line. Um, but of course, with all of this, and certainly this ties into the first point that says lower in sugar, but you still need your grapes to be sufficiently ripe, so therefore not underripe, and that is to avoid any green or herbaceous characters. So any unwanted sort of leafy green characters, stalkiness, um, the lean notes you may get uh, in underripe grapes. So it's really thinking about the ripeness of the grapes uh, and then of course their acidity. Now in naturally cold climates such as Champagne or say England, um, the, uh, the lower sugar uh, is often, of course, very easy to obtain. The higher in acidity is easy to obtain, but the latter point, the ripeness of the grapes may be an issue. Uh, so it is, of course, about understanding your vineyard, citing your grapes or sourcing your grapes from areas that may potentially get better ripeness to counter those that may be a little bit more green or underripe. Um, so there's lots of things to think about. Also, there are, of course, warmer climates that sparkling wines are made in. And the necessity when you are in a warmer zone, so this may be somewhere like California, um, you know, there are many, many more you can cite, such as the Mediterranean areas like Carver as well. These warmer regions, of course, will not have naturally cold climates. So they will conversely worry about the acidity, not necessarily the lower sugars. Um, they'll get the ripeness of the grapes. They may worry about too much sugar uh, and then a lack of acidity. So it is important that as a grape grower, a farmer, to get the best out of your grapes, you will tend to pick on the earlier side to maintain the acidity levels and still have the ripeness and good sugars, but really to maintain the high acidity levels in order to have the freshness and then, of course, to go through the autolytic processes. So warmer regions, um, picking early is a necessity. And if you visit places like South Africa, California, um, the first parts of the harvest that come in are those grapes that are used for sparkling wine production. And then thinking more about vineyard considerations around, of course, when the fruit comes in to the winery, you basically want your fruit as um, fresh and intact as possible. Uh, so you will need to handle it very carefully. So the harvests must be done often by hand, not always, but often by hand, um, to make sure the fruit will come in um, whole and intact, uh, and then normally done in times like the middle of the night or early morning, so when it's cold, and this is to stop um, and arrest any kind of premature fermentation uh, that may happen with those grapes. So you have to handle them careful. Think about shallow baskets with only um, a number of bunches in them once they've been picked and not just big, big trucks full where there may be some uh, premature pressing and crushing of those grapes. Okay, so um, intact fruit is very much wanted. The um, problems with, of course, fruit that gets spoiled, that can um, drastically affect the these wines that often can be quite delicate. Winery considerations. So the winery considerations are really, once again, extending what we've just been talking about from the vineyard considerations, and that is handling uh, your, your grapes and then your juice very, very carefully. Um, and that is really to create a very clean and fresh juice. So you'll often find that when the grapes come into the winery, they will be pressed exceptionally quick um, but gently. And this is, uh, so of course the quickness is so they're not sitting there and, and spoiling in any way with any warm temperatures in a winery. And then the gentle pressing eventually when it occurs is so that you will liberate the free run juice 
Um, and that can be, of course, extracted and then taken away and separated. Um, but you don't disturb much of the skins and you don't disturb the pips, which, of course, you'll, in, you'll in, uh, uh, find the tannin and any kind of bitterness. So that will happen quite quickly, but very gently as the grapes come into the winery. Now, whole bunches will often be used in presses. Uh, and this is once again to really make sure that the bunch of grapes is left intact and this avoids any unwanted crushing. So it's all about pressing and not crushing. If there is unwanted crushing, you will extract potentially color from the skins um, and tannin, which are two things that you may really not want in your final sparkling wine. So whole bunch pressing is used often to avoid crushing. And in European areas, um, certainly areas that have a lot of history, a lot of tradition behind them, and then a lot of regulation, you will find that there are laws in place to um, really govern the quality of these sparkling wines. There will be maximum pressure levels for the pressing, so it doesn't get too intensive and therefore that will maintain better quality, but also the amount that you can extract from your grapes. So the amount of juice that you can extract from that pressing. There are often limits on these, once again, to govern quality, because there, there comes a point that when you extract juice from grapes, um, it moves from being a very sort of free run juice to a much more heavily skin affected juice or oxidized juice. So um, in Champagne, for instance, they call the, the, the first kind of key part of the press, the cuvee. And then they, uh, we'll talk about this in a, pre, in, a, in a future slide, but then they call the end of it a tie. Anything after that is not permitted for quality production of champagne. Okay, so that is some key considerations to have initially. We will repeat a lot of those as we go through presentations for sparkling wine later on down the line. Um, we're going to go through the five methods of um, sparkling wine that you are required to know at the level three certificate. Um, three of them you really have to have quite good knowledge about. Um, the other two are, are a little bit more minimal. Now, I'm not going to go through them in detail now. I am just listing them because they will be on future ones. So the next presentation will go through the traditional method in depth. Um, and then we'll look at champagne in the third session, which is an example of the traditional method. And then in the fourth session, we'll actually look at Carver, Cremont, and other sparkling wines that use this method as well. So really for sessions two, three, and four, videos two, three, and four, we will be focusing on the traditional method. Um, then we'll go through um, session five, we'll actually be on other methods. Um, and that is talking, of course, about the tank method, transfer method, uh, things like the ASTI method and also carbonation. And then the last presentation will be on the examples of uh, styles from, that are made by those processes. So traditional will have a big focus in the next three videos. Um, transfer method will be focused on later on down the line and the tank method. So I call these the three T's, um, which uh, you need to know certainly a lot about the traditional and the, the, and the tank transfer. Then we have um, the ASTI method, which is a variation of the tank method. And then we have carbonation, which of course is the real short cut method of obtaining bubbles in a liquid. Um, so that's very minor. Um, and uh, is, is unlikely to be tested on, but we'll mention a little about it later on down the line. Let me just once again, so you are exceptionally clear about what you really need to know here. You really need to have good fundamental understanding of the traditional method, of the tank method, and then of ASTI, the ASTI method. They're the, the big ones. The transfer method, um, normally is only really reserved for multiple choice questions. There may be minor written notes on it, and carbonation is very minor, but the traditional method could make up a real big part and percentage of your sparkling wine written question. And there are questions around Prosecco, which is the tank method, and ASTI, of course, with the ASTI method. So those three are areas you really should significantly focus on, and I will on future videos. Okay, so they're your major methods. Then we have the styles. So these are um, 
a number of labels that I have picked out to help you understand these styles. Let me just see if I've got any examples in here. No, we don't have examples in here so much. Um, but we do have the um, the styles. Now, this uh, is a non-vintage label. Now, actually, the, the terminology non-vintage is not a labeling term. It is much more of an unofficial term uh, about most of sparkling wine that is made via the traditional method in the world, certainly in areas that are cool, that have inconsistency of their climate. So weather patterns that can play havoc with the climate. What this means, of course, is that you blend years, vintages, together. And that is to counter the inconsistency of these vintages. So you may have, for example, very good 2015 vintage, very um, difficult 2014 vintage, uh, 14 vintage, very difficult 13 vintage, and you blend those together really to create a bit more consistency. And this creates house styles, um, that creates that balance, creates that consistency. It's quite important. Here you'll see it's not a labeling term. You don't find non-vintage on the label, um, but anything that doesn't tell you that it's a vintage or there's a year on it will be a non-vintage. You also may see that there is a movement for calling this multi-vintage instead of non-vintage. And that's something which Champagne is definitely going through uh, today. So that is Verve Clico there. Um, the next one is vintage. So we'll pick the same house, the same Champagne house in Rams. And that is Verve Clico again. This one clearly identifies to you that this is a vintage. And you can see that just down here. So 2008. And in fact, they have actually identified for you at the bottom that this is a vintage. So this, in fact, is not from a blend of years. This is more likely to be from a single vintage. Um, in some parts of the world, they may allow very small percentages of other years to be blended in. But normally, when you see a vintage on the label, it's going to be 100% or a very large percentage of that wine. And this is normally produced in years that are you know, good, very good to outstanding, that are a good representation of that year. Um, so if there is a poorer vintage, then they might utilize the wines actually for more blending for non-vintage. So vintage champagnes can be very, very high in quality, often take a little bit longer to develop as other vintage sparkling wines in the world. The next one is rosé or pink in English, uh, and it is a fascinating terminology. It's something that I often preach about because most people call it rosé in the world. It's such a big brand of a colour. Um, but really, the English of it is pink. So we should call them pink champagnes, which some of us do, of course, and there's been some brilliant songs written about that. Um, but we often don't. Uh, so these are, of course, um, champagnes or sparkling wines, which will have a, a pinkish colour to them. Now, in the world, um, this can be obtained in a number of ways. Rosé champagne or pink champagne uh, or other sparkling wines can have um, often red blended into it, often Pinot Noir, to give it its colour. So you have a white sparkling and you add in some red wine, and that is a blending method to gain that colour. There are some that uh, will actually do the maceration on skins, and that is to give, of course, a bit more darker colour to it and potentially more flavour profile and depth, more of a gastronomical style. So you may find those as well. Um, so it's basically uh, very similar sort of uh, to what you would learn about um, rosé production of still wines, but, but here they, they do allow the blending method. Why is it still permitted? Well, the blending method, certainly in places like Champagne, is permitted because it gives you um, less tannic extraction. Gives you good colour, but uh, really doesn't give you too much bitterness or tannic extraction. Uh, the next one uh, is going to look at the terminology prestige cuvee. So here is a champagne label still of Verve Clicquot. This is Le Grand Dame. A prestige cuvee is, once again, not really a labeling term. You won't see the words of prestige cuvee on the label. Um, but each house uh, normally has a very top champagne. 
and uh, sorry, a top sparkling wine. I keep saying champagne as it's the it's the the example given in this picture, but we can have prestige cuvées across the word of the world. Generally speaking, though, a prestige cuvée is something which is very French um, and certainly very champenois, uh, and it's a top one. So they'll often have fancy names. Uh, you, of course, will know many of these. So Paul Roger's top is Winston Churchill. Uh, you have um, Moet and Chandons as Dom Perignon, and we have Verve Clicquot here as Le Grand Dame. So this is um, basically from grapes that are often their highest quality, often from Grand Cru sites, uh, and very, you know, very interesting and high quality stuff overall. Um, so this tends to be the most premium side of Champagne. Um, the most premium side of champagne uh, and the most yeah, the most um, uh, complex uh, style, but not an official labeling term. Um, then we have uh, the styles called Blanc de Blanc and we have Blanc de Noir. Uh, these are quite uh, nice and easy, quite obvious. Uh, so Blanc de Blanc is uh, means white of whites and Blanc de Noir means white of blacks. And these are things you'll learn actually at lower level WSET. Uh, here on the left, you have uh, the top uh, prestige cuvee of Tatanger, which is Comte de Champagne. And this is a Blanc de Blanc, purely made from Chardonnay. Blanc de Blanc means purely made from white grapes. Um, in some regions, this will mean purely ch uh, Chardonnay, but around the world, it could be any other white grapes. So you have to be a little bit careful. You can't make complete assumptions you have to know the region behind it. And Blanc de Noir from black grapes only, Pinot Noir, Meunier, for instance. Um, but once again, you could get a Blanc de Noir uh, made in Catalonia, for instance, which could be made from Garnacha, Trepat, uh, and other black grape varieties. Okay. Um, Blanc de Blanc will tend to be a bit more elegant. Um, they have much higher acidities behind them, whereas Blanc de Noir tend to be a bit richer and, of course, rounder. Um, and then finally, something which uh, is not really great to teach. It's not the most passionate side of the wine industry, but then sweetness levels, of course. And there are differing sweetness levels through the sparkling wine industry. And we have sweetness levels across, um, different sweetness levels across a lot of the sparkling category due to really history uh, and, of course, you know, taste. Um, their big uh, initial markets of, of champagne, for instance, were Russia, and Britain, and having a bit of a sweet tooth, they quite liked the sugary styles. Um, so they have continued, although there has been a big movement of late to more drier styles. So these are, in fact, the European Union labeling terminologies for sweetness levels in different languages. So you have Brut Nature, Brut Natural, uh, Nature Herb, and Zero Dosage. Um, so that's our first list at the top. This will often mean natural, uh, the natural sugar level of the sparkling wine without out any additions. So it's naught to three grams per liter, no addition of sugar, absolutely. Uh, and these will, um, it'll be any, any kind of natural sugar that's left behind from the secondary fermentation. So very low, very austere and very acidic. You then have extra brut styles with what that have tend to have a little bit more sugar. So um, of up to sort of six grams per liter. The famous category, of course, is Brut, and Brut uh, is your, your big category that generally means dry, but you can see it can be up to 12 grams per litre. Now, please note that this is for the EU. In specific regions across Europe, there will be slight um, variances on these ranges. So, for, for example, a Brut in Champagne is 6 to 12 grams per litre, um, but uh, it's 0 to 12. So there's actually an overlap here. Um, with the first three, which is interesting in itself. Then you have something called extra sec, uh, and that is your, strangely translated, of course, to extra dry, um, but this has more sugar, 12 to 17 grams per litre. Um, then you have something called sec, which is 17 to 32, demi sec, 32 to 50, and then finally sweet. The ones that WSET uh, really focus on, um, which you tend to see, uh, in that's worked into questions will of course be brut, uh, will be sec, uh, and will be demi sec. So please make sure you definitely know the ranges of, of sugar levels in those three specific. Now, um, 
they uh, they tend to be multiple choice questions though in this instance because they are ranges and of course they can try and trick you with those ranges so you have to pick the correct range per sugar level okay so that um, brings us towards the end of this section now there's no written working question on this one because it is an introduction there will be plenty coming up in all of the next videos so videos two through to six we'll have lots of working written questions at the end of each section um, so I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to uh, sparkling wine to the styles and sweetness levels um, if you have any comments or questions or concerns please do get in touch with us uh, by leaving a comment in the YouTube um, uh, description below this video or you can get in touch through any of this social media as well. If you did want to subscribe for access to the Wine with Jimmy e-learning portal, which gives you a brilliant wealth of mock questions, revision sessions, flashcards, more videos to help you with your WICT studies, then please do look at the winewithjimmy.com e-learning portal and click on the relevant links. There's The link will be in the bottom underneath this uh, video as well. So it's been a pleasure as always. Uh, please, if you're in London, come and see us for a class. Come and see us for a glass or a bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Thank you so much.